We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. I want to welcome you to our session on platform economy, post-pandemic chances for SMEs. My name is Friederike Grote. I'm partner at Grote Niedekassalt in Hamburg, Germany, and I have the honor to moderate our discussion today. A warm welcome to all of you in Katowice at the remote hubs connected and to everyone following us online from so many places around the world. Thank you for joining us for this workshop. And thank you for joining from uh, different time zones, even those in which it is already really late in the evening. So thanks for being here. Platforms, as we all know and feel and can experience uh, every day, are of increasing importance for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises as they start the process of digital transformation or even expand their services online. Platforms have also been very helpful for maintaining business during lockdown. However, it is not always easy for SMEs to take use, take advantage of these platform economies opportunities. Today, we want to explore the framework conditions that will support SMEs fruitful and their fruitful participation in the platform business and to learn from each other's best practices. And believe me, there are many to share. I've already learned a little bit about it. I'm very glad to have the most knowledgeable ex expert, experts for this discussion. They experience entrepreneurs and actively supporting the emergence of a prospering digital business ecosystem. I would like to introduce Alex Ntale first. Alex is Chief Executive Officer of the Rwanda ICT Chamber. And his work at the Chamber involves bridging the gap between private and public sector players in the ICT industry, as well as overseeing and establishing new innovation programs for technology startups and innovators. So the ICT Chamber is the industry, IT Industry Association of Rwanda. Welcome, Alex. We have Thank you very much. Guest we have as guest also Anna Paula Biala. She is a founding partner of BFA, Biala Facetti Associados in Brazil, who provide legal, regulatory, and public policy services to different companies. Currently, Anna is head of the working group on, on internet regulation of Brascom. This is a Brazilian association of information and communication technology and digital companies. Anna has been actively involved in the crafting of the regulatory environment of telecommunications in Brazil in various uh, capacities, and I'm sure we'll hear about this later. Welcome, Anna. Shivendra. Shivendra Singh is Vice President of NASCOM, India's National Association of Software and Services Companies. As head of the Global Trade Development Department at NASCOM, Shivendra is responsible for cross-border technology policy engagement, enhancing market access, and actually easing the way business can be done cross-border. And Shivendra is working on building a global alignment on the digital economy, so he's traveling a lot. Welcome, Shivendra. Manan. Manan Vaskanyan is founder and CEO of Stalik, a B2B platform in the construction industry. Stalik helps her customers to create unique interiors by providing inspiration and a better shopping experience. The platform connects the main players for interiors projects. These are manufacturers, vendors, architects, craftsmen, and customers. That sounds almost like a multi-sided platform and not only a two-sided platform, and we will learn about this later too. With a degree in architecture, Mayan has worked in the digital economy right from the start of her business career. And Atsushi, Atsushi Yamanaka, is a professor at the Kobe, Kobe Institute of Computing Graduate School, of the Institute's Graduate School, KIC. 
He's also currently serving as chief advisor of the Rwanda ICT Innovation Ecosystem Strengthening Project. It's a long title. But this project aims to foster a conducive innovation ecosystem in Rwanda. In his role, he has been supported by the government of Japan through the Japan International Cooperation Agency. Welcome, Itsushi. Thank you. Now, um, before we start, let me make a few remarks uh, on how, uh, to the audience, to all of you, how you can actively participate in the discussion. If you are connected via Zoom, you can write in the chat as usual, or raise your hand to take the floor. If you want to make to take the floor, please make sure to raise your hand via Zoom, no matter if you are on site in Katowice in conference room four, or if you are online somewhere else. In the conference room, though, there are also, of course, uh, um, technicians who help you, and there are microphones on the floor, and you can, can go there and make yourself seen. If you're following us via YouTube, Slido would be your option. Our online moderator, Katerina, who some of you have already seen, will now share his screen with the QR code for Slido. Okay. And we have this picture a little bit while I speak. And so everybody who's interested can um, take the picture of the QR code or connect otherwise. Slido has a few questions already and you can post your observations. We will screen share every now and then what has been posted so far along our discussion. The poll will be open until tomorrow evening and this way you have the chance to, um, you have some extra time to add your comments if you wish to. Katerina will also manage the Zoom chat, answer questions, offer technical advice if needed, support, and she also has an eye on Slido. Now, dear audience, we are looking forward to your contributions. Okay, and we are off for the discussions. Uh, we want to talk first about how the platform economy um, is able to promote SMEs and how SMEs can tackle their challenges. And so, Alex, I would like to know from you, in your opinion, what is the greatest potential of the platform economy for SMEs? Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Frederica. Um, I think the, the, the greatest potential that um, we've seen, at least in our environment, um, is clustered in around three elements or three aspects. One is increased access to markets, uh, two, increased access to financial services, and increased access to skills uh, development and skills or capacity building. Mm -hmm. And um, for, for the platform economy, uh, what we have seen in the uh, recent past, uh, even catalyzed by, by COVID-19, is that it grows with the internet or the internet gives it uh, quite uh, a stupendous uh, growth rate. And that uh, is really what, what is feeding in. But uh, going back to access to markets, what we have seen with platform economy is that it is leveling the playing field and enabling um, removing barriers that previously, uh, whether it's uh, geographical barriers or time um, and so on, or even resourcing uh, technology wise uh, that were needed uh, for uh, SMEs to participate uh, in the global economy or even in the local economy. And that is um, uh, where we're seeing a lot of opportunity. Uh, World Bank uh, Group uh, IFC uh, estimated uh, that by 2025, um, the internet economy in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, will be valued at over $180 billion wow. uh, by 2025. Now, uh, it highlights uh, a few uh, subcategories or subsectors uh, that will drive this growth. Uh, uh, fintech, um, e-commerce, um, the gig uh, gig economy, which is also falls into uh, into that uh, into that uh, space. But when you uh, lump all these up and look deeper, uh, what's really um, at the foundation of it all is um, technologies uh, such as uh, cloud uh, cloud services or SaaS. 
uh, that removes um, investment requirements that would previously have been a hindrance uh, to SMEs with um, really very uh, little resources uh, to participate. And that's uh, here uh, for us at home, what we have been seeing, um, the case actually uh, is a recent survey in, in, in Kenya uh, indicated that 90% uh, of surveyed businesses use M-Pesa uh, for payments, for accepting payments. Um, in Rwanda, uh, just last year at the height of, uh, of the pandemic, we saw an increase uh, in digital payments of over 400%. And um, that, um, what does that uh, speak to? It, immediately we saw financial service providers beginning to use that kind of uh, data uh, to improve and to innovate and to provide new solutions uh, to, uh, to SMEs, uh, whether it is uh, credit facilities, uh, as well as insurance, uh, insurance products. So on a whole, I, I can say that uh, this is increasing, whether it is uh, customer engagement or supplier engagement, MS, uh, SMEs, uh, are being um, uh, supported. Uh, on the second part, which is access to financial services, where we see the greatest opportunities um, and, and potential is that Africa has been, um, or even SMEs in, on the continent and mostly in developing countries have had a challenge of accessing financial services simply because the data about their credit worthiness uh, was missing and new, uh, what these platforms are doing are generating data, are facilitating that data generation process. And with that, uh, providing new um, mechanisms or new tools uh, for uh, product developers uh, that are developing, whether it's lending uh, instruments or, um, or other instruments. And that um, is also the, the other factor now. Uh, I, won't, I won't go into YouTube and its capacity and other platforms like Coursera and um, Udemy and Upwork, ETC, which are increasingly becoming um, uh, the go-to uh, place um, for people to learn quick uh, trades, uh, for people who want to improve their capabilities and SMEs on how to use uh, different technologies to increase their uh, to improve, the, uh, grow their businesses. So th that's where we're seeing uh, the opportunity is immense. Um, and, and we're seeing that it is, uh, it, it, it is uh, growing uh, at home and within the region. Wow, that was a, that was a very uh, uh, lively picture of really a vibrant industry or a vibrant economy, really. And I saw uh, several nods from, from our other discussions. And um, I think um, when talking about the possibilities of, of mobile payment, I would I'd like to start with this a little bit and the technical infrastructure needed to do this. Um, Anna, Paula, I, I saw you nod at this point, at this part particularly, I hope I got it right. How would you like to, to further move on, on on that aspect before we address others? Um, I, I was nodding because in a certain way, I would say access to the, the, the financial system is uh, very broad and disseminated um, in Brazil. Um, and this absolutely has had a huge impact in the ability, especially, I guess, during the pandemic of SMEs to uh, make the shift um, to actually um, uh, broadening the offer of um, the services that they were doing. Um, and, uh, and being able to uh, implement uh, mobile payment solutions um, that um, make just with the number of your phone, you can actually make a money transfer um, and that just facilitates uh, what would otherwise be a, a barrier to interest in terms of complexity of how you operate financial systems. And with that really um, um, small, uh, simple entrepreneurs can just launch um, a, a platform or launch their services in an e-commerce platform and be able to complete the cycle um, to a certain extent. So, um, and, and I, I, 
I hear and I guess I, I second all the, the issues that Alex I'm has sorry, raised. Your, but your last words were not uh, um, audible. Uh, um, I was concluding to say I second uh, all the issues yeah. that Alex raised. Um, and um, indeed, uh, from the mobile payment perspective, being able to implement uh, a, a solution that facilitates is absolutely essential uh, for the inclusion uh, of SMEs um, in, the, in the digital uh, platform mm -hmm. ecosystems. And we have seen uh, the growth of mobile payments uh, in Brazil, and that is a driver for uh, especially uh, small enterprises to mm -hmm. actually uh, succeed. Mm -hmm. So it really lowers the threshold for, for market access at, the, at this point. Uh, of course, but when you talk about mobile payments, there's uh, one big issue, uh, I won't say in a nutshell, because it's really a big issue, but it's the, the, the question of trust. You, you, you need trust that, that uh, you really have the, 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 the correct uh, partner on the other side of the transaction. And... And uh, Shivendra, I know that you've worked on this on, on uh, well, it's cybersecurity issue, but it boils down really to, to small issues too of, of, of trust and offering hands-on support. Um, would you like to comment on that? So thank you so much, uh, Frederick. Uh, I think uh, the first and foremost important thing is that digital economy is, is where we are going to see all the growth uh, you know, which is happening. So I call it digital transformation 2.0 because this is digital at scale. So whether it's uh, AI, uh, you know, cloud, uh, you know, machine learning, cybersecurity, all of these 5G uh, robotics, all of this is, is driving, uh, you know, huge, huge growth. In fact, uh, so much so that uh, Traditional uh, you know, technologies are coming down from about 70% to about 30%, and digital transformation 2.0 will grow to about uh, from 30 to about 60 to 70%. Uh, and this has been, uh, you know, uh, driven by by a number of factors. Uh, you know, as we know, uh, in 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 the period where uh, you know we've seen uh, the pandemic, uh, the tech sector has become even more important. So when we come to trust, for all of this to thrive, uh, you know, um, you know whether it's cloud services, and I, I, I heard Alex talk about, uh, you know, cloud adoption, whether it's uh, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, this is growing by leaps and bounds, you know, between 16 to 50 percent. Um, you know, we did a recent survey in India. And, uh, you know, and then one of the big concerns, uh, you know, CXOs have pointed out is on data privacy. And, 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 and this is something which, uh, you know, is very important around the world. We are seeing a lot of traction and we don't have a body like a WTO, you know, OECD is doing some work. And then, you know, we are trying to see there is a Schrems 2 judgment and EU has gone ahead with GDPR and you know, GDPR and, you know, uh, and then UK is, India is coming out with its own personal data protection bill. I think one of the things that we, we all need to build is an alignment on, on cross data, data flows because, you know, this is, like a, or a, this is like a horizontal cutting across AI, cybersecurity, cloud, 5G, 6G. And, you know, for all of this to grow, uh, you know, data privacy and security are going to be very, very key. How do we build an alignment, uh, you know, globally uh, to ensure cross-border data flows, uh, you know, and I think an interoperability around, uh, you know, some of these areas. So I think that's uh, something that we as NASCOM have been working very closely, uh, you know, especially because we have a number of FTAs, free trade agreements uh, working on both with the UK and, and with the EU. Uh, and so we are trying to see if, uh, you know, Associations, uh, you know, in this case, UK associations and, and NASCOM have put together a joint paper, uh, which we are finalizing, uh, you know, to present to our respective governments. While while the personal data protection bill comes in, uh, and you know, while there is a lot of overhang from EU GDPR, uh, how do we work on building that? And I think that's going to be very very critical for all the great growth that we are talking about, uh, which needs to happen. This could potentially be a bottleneck, 
um, and, and, and we all need to work together on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Um, how, how can we um, find the, the criteria necessary really for this alignment, as you called it? Uh, and I would like to comment on that. Well, you know, yeah. sorry, did you ask me or someone else? Sorry. I, I asked I ask, uh, the, the, the panel and of course the audience too, if they want to share. Um, maybe Anna first and then you again, Shivanda. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I would say um, the the issue of cross border data flow is um, um, instrumental to uh, allowing for uh, this new digital ec ec economy to actually flourish. And um, and and the challenge here is uh, beyond uh, it's the international interoperability of actually legal frameworks that allow for the international data flow. Um, and Brazil, for reference, has um, uh, implemented a very similar model to um, GDPR. Um, and uh, also uh, the um, uh, equating the challenges that come from, um, from law enforcement and data localization initiatives. So it's equating the free flow of information and um, uh, data sovereignty uh, provisions for that. And I guess the challenge here is where do you find um, a, a place, a locus for this discussion to um, take place globally mm -hmm. uh, in a way that it can actually be then implemented locally because it will need um, to interact with all uh, local and national uh, provisions. But uh, I agree, this is uh, absolutely maybe the top priority to actually ensure that we can take the step forward and to uh, ensuring that the, the global reach um, uh, goes um, uh, goes through speed, um, so mm -hmm. to speak, especially for SMEs. But I would say um, that is a cross border throughout all um, players in the digital economy. A brief, brief question to Anna again. What is um, follow up question? What is you, you said? We need a place to do that. Would you see such a place? Do you know one? Is there one? Uh, I have a really hard time finding uh, what the the correct um, or the ideal place uh, would be. Um, I guess we are, uh, and this is an interesting aspect because in the end, uh, the uh, digital economy challenges concepts uh, that we have in business models and all the traditional ways to offer uh, services and products. And I guess it also challenges the way that we look at regulation and legislation and how the interplay uh, of those will work. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure that at this okay. point we, we have this, um, this locus and maybe this is a, an excellent question for, uh, for IGF to, to explore as yes. it has numerous implications. Okay, thank you. Shivanda, briefly, and then I want to, to tie in the other speakers too. Yeah, you know, I would I would say that you know, EU GDPR, let's say, is probably the is the first of uh, in in the race to be able to define uh, the rules on that, and everyone is kind of working around uh, you know what they think uh, are the good parts of GDPR and what they think could be challenges of that. From our perspective, uh, you know, we feel that. Because cross-border data flows are absolutely essential for uh, the digital economy to thrive, uh, you know, you need to look at, you know, the certification schemes. So while uh, a data adequacy is the ultimate objective, but till the time uh, data adequacy agreements are signed, uh, you know, you need to look at the standard contractual clauses, the certification schemes. I know for a fact that the certification schemes, uh, you know, are are not very easy uh, you know, for the SMEs. So how can we make the certification schemes a bit more easier uh, you know, for the SMEs to kind of work on and follow? Because uh, SMEs obviously don't lead on all of these de developments, but this is a bottleneck for them as they move forward. Right. Could organizations uh, be permitted to create or identify their own transfer tools it is one aspect. And mm -hmm. then when we look at data classification, uh, and, uh, you know, what is the way that you can classify data uh, in order to, again, streamline, um, you know, flows. And last but not the least, uh, you know, the individual 
ability to access uh, and, and, and seek uh, legal redressal, mm -hmm. I think uh, needs to be uh, clarified and alignment needs to be built on that. So these are a few points. Uh, as, and, and I think as associations uh, here in this uh, panel as well, if, if we are able to jointly make a recommendation uh, mm -hmm. towards this, and you know, I'll be very, okay. very happy to put up our hands to, to do that with everyone. Okay, so joining in associations, we have the uh, we have three here: ICT uh, Chamber Rwanda also, and uh, ICT Chamber has already worked together with uh, a German ICT association called Bitme. And maybe Alex, you want to briefly say, tell us how you worked um, on standards together with Bitme. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I think the the, the the point of standardizing and really uh, having a single source of truth or at least uh, having uh, one place where people are able to recognize um, to, yeah, who is who uh, is, is important. So what we've been working on is still work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, it seeks to uh, provide a framework uh, nationally uh, for uh, for players to be able to be identified um, or different uh, with different level uh, of uh, uh, scores um, in terms of it's we call it the Rwanda Tech Seal um, with a, with the purpose of really giving a buyer or a partner or an investor um, some level of confidence um, along different um, parameters. Uh, one of them. Uh, being data privacy, but um, also compliance on on some of the um, some of the regulatory uh, frameworks that are available, uh, and then of of course um, depending on 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 who is looking, sometimes uh, the compliance is for RFDA for e-commerce companies. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's uh, it's it's uh, it's compliance for fintech regulations uh, or um, for cybersecurity elements, the data privacy that I was talking about. So we, we're working, uh, we're still working on that. Uh, we currently uh, building out, um, automating uh, th th that process. Uh, we last, uh, I think, uh, leading up to 2020, uh, we we managed to certify four uh, four mm -hmm. companies. Um, mm -hmm. That was just in the, in the pilot uh, pilot phase. Um, going uh, on now uh, with the automation process, we believe we'll be able to reach out uh, for more. Uh, earlier this year, we had ran a self-assessment process uh, with over 40, uh, 40 companies. And um, that is uh, really helping us to fine tune as uh, an organization that uh, works with innovators. Uh, we are ourselves trying to see how we can innovate uh, mm -hmm. to give our confidence and build trust uh, mm -hmm. in the in the consumers of our of our services. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm I will return to the trust issue from a practical side, but also I would like to ask at Sushi first um, be, because you've worked on on in Japan and in Africa and also in other uh, nations, uh, other continents. Um, where do you see the, the, the place where this kind of alignment that we were just talking about, uh, wh where could this happen? So if we have the industry um, industry statements, joint statements or so, would, would, this is something virtual. Do the, where would they meet to, except for IDF, obviously, but where would they meet to, to come up with ideas and solutions? Thank you, thank you, Frederick. Yes, that's true, actually. Um, at least, for example, cybersecurity and data privacy. So that's a very, very, very big issue um, in many countries. And like in countries in Africa, they are passing the regulation laws saying that all personal identifiable information about the citizen have to remain in the country. So, mm -hmm. of course, that would actually really hinder cross-border mm -hmm. transactions. It's, it's going to be a big deal. Now, um, there is going to be a fine balance, I think. Of course, the state, the government want to keep their information, their citizens' information safeguarded, and they also not to be exploited, of course. Um, but there's also the growing needs because transactions mm -hmm. is actually global nowadays. 
Um, one of the things, of course, I mean, it has been mentioned so far in quite many panelists here, GDPR actually has been uh, basically many of the standards where a lot of um, you know, the countries actually uh, adapting from the GDPR perspective and creating their own cybersecurity and data pre uh, protection regime. Mm -hmm. And also um, around that, there is actually regional conventions, for example, Manabo conventions in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. And if mm -hmm. I remember correctly, it was a, uh, it was a Budapest convention. <laughs> There's so many cities named convention, I think for the European. Uh, regarding the data protections and cyber security. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, so there's actually regional organizations, which is actually, um, you know, convention wise, they are trying to actually promote sort of standardizations or harmonization mm -hmm. between the different actually data protection and cyber security regimes. And that is also, sorry, do you want to say something? <laughs> no, no, go <laughs> on. Yeah, I have a, okay. I have a follow up question. Yes, but. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So basically, on, on that front, I think there is. is quite interesting or quite important actually act, uh, actions within the regional organizations to basically provide the framework. And then they could sort of uh, negotiate between the regional organizations okay. to, to make sure that uh, we have a global you know, stuff for standard mm -hmm. or framework mm -hmm. or policies to do so. Now that's actually harmonization parts, uh, but there's another side of the coin to it. You know, it's, it's always good to actually have the harmonized policies. But uh, the challenge really is how to implement them, right? Mm -hmm. The compliance is a big thing. For example, yeah. uh, a lot of African countries and a lot of, you know, a lot of developing countries and developed countries, they are instituting the digital national IDs or a common national ID system. Mm -hmm. um, enforcement of that or implementation of that is really, um, you know, it's a problem. For example, Kenya, uh, they have, uh, um, uh, they have a, they have a new a sort of ID where they could actually do the government transactions, um, but they just actually created you know they actually started with this initiative first, but they created data commissioner just like uh, you know a half a years ago. Mm -hmm. So the compliance or the enforcement or the implementation of this you know standard or the framework that is going to be really the issue, especially in the developing countries and especially with SMEs. Uh, I think Alex mentioned about this as well, but that is going to be the key. How can we actually encourage both the, the government uh, as well as like uh, private sectors to actually have, you know, to comply uh, with this uh, and also implement this framework? I think that is really the key mm -hmm. for moving forward. Okay, thank you. I, I heard that uh, it is good if we have some some starters or front runners in various areas and then others can can follow but um international data flow uh, um, reliability trustworthiness um i want to bring in manan sorry shivendra for the moment but i want to bring in manan with her experience um how does this translate to your experience um you are working hands-on really on developing your platform. You started out with, a, with an e-commerce, with an online shop basically, but now you're starting the B2B platform. And uh, the GDPR is of course a, as a, um, uh, a law that, uh, that manages privacy issues and not business data flow, not really. I mean, it's important, it's very important to create trust, but business data is maybe something, something else. And your companies, the companies you work with, your clients, of business data maybe they want to share or don't want to share. Yes, um, thank you. Um, mostly we don't have that much trouble with business data actually, to mm -hmm. be honest. Um, we have issues with, with the GDPR because um, we are of course using software from the US. I mean, everyone is using a AWS, everyone is using Microsoft, etc. And um, it's not clear if you're actually supposed to use those tools in Germany, if you're creating a platform, because um, you never know what happens to the personal data. So this is, of course, an issue we have to think about, because uh, there are no comparable companies in Germany that you can use to build a platform like that. Um, regarding the business data, uh, all of them are quite free, actually, because you can always just uh, find the data online as well. Um, they are very interested in gathering customer customer information. Um, mm -hmm. Who's ordering what product? How many 
uh, items are they ordering? Um, what kind of person is ordering? What kind of product? Um, I think this is one of the most valuable information you can gather uh, online. Mm -hmm. It's very valuable to our um, companies as well, and we will still have to find a way to to be able to deliver trends without <laughs> um, without um, um, mismanaging the trust. Mm -hmm. Or oh, yeah, well, the, the disclosing customer data. Yes. But I was all, all also talking or thinking about the prices, like price transparency would also give maybe, and you're, you said you're, you're a very uh, a special branch of industry, mm -hmm. fragmented. And so everybody would be, I guess, very, very interested in the prices that, that uh, your clients, like manufacturers on the one side and maybe architects or, or builders on the other side, um, um, are paying for a special product or a service. Or if, How do you manage this kind of business data? This has to stay secret. We will okay. only be able to, to show the recommended reselling prices. And of course, the vendors can mm -hmm. show the prices they want to set for their products. But we will never be able to actually show the prices that have been paid. Because if okay. an architect is buying huge amounts for a big project, the prices are always been uh, talked about separately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but we have also um, seen some vendors who said, uh, so some manufacturers who said, we can't disclose our vendors because we are afraid that uh, competitors could <laughs> address the same vendors. I mean, this is really weird in 2021, right? Because <laughs> every, <laughs> everything is digitalized. So these are some weird issues we are actually dealing with. Okay, but, but not on a large scale, as I take it. Well, on a daily basis. <laughs> okay, on it. Well, well, I, that could be a large scale. Um, Shivanda, is that still something? Uh, is your comment still still? Um, does it match where we are now in the discussion? No, I just wanted to uh, you know take the discussion with uh, Atsushi uh, mentioned uh, in terms of compliance and uh, digital uh, national ID. I think at at the India level. Uh, one of the big success stories has been the public digital platforms that India has. Um, you know, a number of years back, we went in for what we call Aadhaar, which is the unique uh, digital identity that we have of uh, more than a billion people, 1.2 billion people, uh, you know, which has not been easy, um, you know, and then UPI, which is a financial, uh, you know, digital payment uh, transaction. In fact, UPI uh, currently has more number of transactions than Visa and Master taken together. Uh, and COVID, which is our app on, uh, uh, you know, uh, COVID uh, vaccinations, again, a billion plus. So I think uh, linking it uh, to compliance and last mile connectivity um, is a great example that uh, uh, the government of India has been able to do through an open source public digital platform. Uh, you know, and from a compliance perspective, I think, um, you know, that has been something which has been a big, uh, you know, success story. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. kind of highlight that point. Uh, at that okay. Point. Okay. Thank you. Anna? I wanted to, to get um, Shvendra's uh, point on compliance and go back to your question around trust. Um, mm -hmm. I think we have a tendency to uh, look at SMEs and trying to do exercise to lower the threshold so the costs are lower and that allows them to have a, more of an, a competitive advantage. And we need to be careful from a policy perspective on that front in the sense that if threshold is lowered in, in terms of data protection or cyber security measures, you are actually uh, lowering the compliance and taking them away uh, from the value chain. So I think we need to uh, change the perspective on how, how we help. It's not by lowering, but actually by giving them uh, easier access, education, capacitation to actually be able to achieve uh, those uh, thresholds, which will be absolutely mm -hmm. central um, for, for, for consumer trust. 
and for them to actually uh, proper, prosper. And I'm, I'm glad I see several colleagues nodding to that. I think that's an essential uh, point in the conversation. We tend um, to look from the traditional economy and we really need to find uh, ways to, to help them um, level uh, the threshold in terms of uh, transparency, data protection, uh, cybersecurity, mm -hmm. uh, consumer uh, support, and so on. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience who wants to comment on this, share your opinion, or um, maybe even take a, send a question or so, please make use of the chat. Uh, use Slido if you want, or raise your hand too. So you are very welcome to do this. Um, I would like to, to move on to another issue that has been very, very vital, vital in, um, in um, shaping the platform economy and the digital economy in general, which is actually uh, um, the scarcity of skilled labor. This has been a problem everywhere. And um, I would like to, to start with Manon maybe to explain how she is basically now as a platform startup, you know, from online, from, from online shop to, to B2B platform, from is kind of a startup, as I understood. Again, it's a big move. But how did you, what are your experiences about labor, skilled labor? It's uh, always been very difficult to find good people. Uh, and for us, it, it has gotten worse actually in the last few months. Um, we yeah. hear from investors that they even have trouble finding experienced laborers, especially technicians for their own companies. And now we as a startup have to find them and be able to pay them with, with the money we have, which is actually not so much. So this is a big problem for us. Um, in our case, we have founded a company in Armenia where the labor prices were supposed to be very much lower than here. But um, it turns out that even the US has um, a very much interest in developing software in Armenia. So even there, the prices are getting up. So um, I think it's getting very hard and even harder to find good people to do what we need to do. And um, I don't think we are uh, even ready to, to um, educate the students in a way that we need to for the future. What do you mean by that? Um, if you still look at, at what, what people are still studying, I don't think there's enough uh, developers out there, actually. Okay. Not for now and not for the future, definitely. Okay. Okay. That was so, so I keep this in mind when we come to our final issue, the, the <laughs> regulatory framework, we want to address this too and, and, and add on that, build on that so that we have to keep that in mind. But Alex, I would like to know from you, you are just doing a... a large-scale project, IHUSO, which is about onboarding um, eye workers, as you call them, and also small and micro-sized and medium business uh, to the platform economy. How are you handling the, the issue? What, would, what is your perspective on the scarcity of skilled labor? Um, thank you again. So this scarcity, uh, um of skilled labor is there is is a fact now we see it as uh, uh, as Manan how it was explaining that our demand today is uh, uh, for developers is high uh, we've had experiences um, from U.S. clients uh, to some of our uh, our member companies asking them for hundreds of developers and even stating they don't care where they come from. Uh, we have others uh, that are asking for thousands. And, um, and, and that really speaks to the fact that uh, digitalization um, of the global economy is happening um, and it's everywhere and that's putting a strain. So what we are trying to do uh, within, uh, within the project um, and with, just with, within the chamber, is to uh, try to use the resources and the innovation hubs that we have uh, to, um, to upskill uh, the talent that we have um, uh, in partnership with uh, different partners, government, as well as development partners. Uh, we're happy the, the, um, the project that, uh, that uh, Atsushi 
uh, Professor Tsushi is leading uh, is facilitating on that where we are, are training developers uh, on a cohort basis, uh, mm -hmm. but also um, running even for other um, uh, training, even in other skills, uh, fourth industrial uh, revolution skills like um, uh, 3D um, computer aided design, computer aided manufacturing, uh, 3D printing, um, uh, all, all sorts of automation. So from, from that point of view, and others actually, <laughs> artificial intelligence. So, so it, it, the, the demand is immense, but uh, beyond uh, having the demand and, and saying, oh, we, we know the demand is out there, we're also creating channels uh, to aggregate uh, aggregation uh, platforms uh, to help uh, identify uh, talent um, at the same time um, to aggregate employers and to know who is looking for what, because uh, uh, you cannot be training for uh, individual, um, individual employers on, a, uh, on an ad hoc basis, uh, but you could identify uh, streams um, of a particular skill sets or technology stacks, um, if it is uh, Java programming, for, for example, or AI and machine learning uh, as a stream then you, you, you have a way of grouping, uh, of creating this kind of groupings and you prepare talent uh, for these, um, uh, for the employers. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's an ongoing process, actually just got a list uh, from, uh, from our partner, government partner of over 2,600 uh, graduates uh, that, are, that are seeking jobs. Uh, but uh, there's a difference between having, an, uh, having a degree, having a paper, and also being uh, being skilled, mm -hmm. having hands-on uh, skills, and and we're looking through that uh, to see that all different uh, groups of engineering skills that are needed. Uh, last week we had a meeting uh, with uh, manufacturers, and uh, they're looking for talent uh, from um, uh, agri processors to metal uh, metal workers uh, and so on. So the, the, the the, the, the demand is there. Uh, luckily for us, uh, we have a young population um, and we, we, we want to position uh, ourselves or position the continent to take advantage of this revolution, uh, right. digital, uh, digital revolution right. that is happening. So, so one takeaway would be that uh, maybe matching platforms could be like, like you are doing now, could, could be a solution, one of, obviously several solutions to, to, to this problem. Anna, I yes. know you've been working at Rascom too, uh, also on, the, on, on this issue of um, scarcity of skilled labor, if I, if I recollect this uh, correctly. And um, what are your experiences? How are you trying to tackle this problem? Uh, Brascom has done a number of studies to um, understand uh, the, the gap uh, between what the, the ICT sector um, needs in terms of, um, of various of various demands and uh, what's actually available in the market. And, and uh, it seems the gap is actually growing. The number is near uh, 100,000 um, um, uh, people uh, without, or 100,000 jobs that lack the people with the capacitation to actually um, uh, fulfill them. Uh, we currently um, have some initiatives in terms of trying to, you need to start early, so trying to include uh, in the educational process in school, uh, coding and STEM capabilities um, to actually be able throughout uh, time to, to bridge uh, that gap. But that, that has been a challenge and it, it really um, uh, there is a big um, effort in terms of including that not only with um, a technical capability courses uh, now, but looking at how you bring them uh, from the start to, to be able to fill that gap. And as you look at, for instance, issues like artificial intelligence, um, that um, we currently have a, a national strategy plan and it's in the works of actually being uh, more relevant in terms of local development. Uh, we do lack the, the people's skills to be able to um, develop that and, and work locally, but, but the number is really stunning. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. 
Um, I would like to, to ask Katerina if we have uh, some uh, Slido uh, contributions to share. And maybe, yes. you, good, can, can you show them, please? I will show them to you in a second. So there we go. So we ask our participants, our attendees, in which area do they see the greatest potential of the platform economy for SMEs? And what we found is market access, actually. There is one tag which was scaling, and then the other four or five tags is actually one sentence, which is uh, launching new cloud platforms on new markets. Mm -hmm. So the system just broke the sentence apart. Wow. <laughs> uh, I think that's this is quite interesting. Um, and then we also had a look at the pandemic pushing the digital transformation of SMEs mm -hmm. and their observations, um, which are also, I think, very, very interesting. For example, the fact that there is no doubt, of course, that the pandemic has pushed the digital transformation for SMEs. The service sector mainly benefited, in my opinion, and one person says that she or he agrees uh, with mm -hmm. this post. And another person says, I would agree that SMEs did ac accelerate the DT. Uh, I am not sure, however, if this was mainly digitizing processes or rethinking the business model on a more profound manner so also very interesting yeah i think i would like to make a break here and mm -hmm. and uh, save the third question for a later point because we have a third question uh, because i i would like to move on to to this question what really happened and what can we learn from what happened for the further uh, promotion of smes in digital uh, and business uh, how how the pandemic affected SMEs. I'm, I'm really curious to, to know that from you, Atsushi. Uh, uh, sorry, Frederick. can I actually make a, a small sort of comment on Anna's point? Yes, about please. Yes, of the, course. The please. needs of a human resource development. I mean, that is a oh, profound, okay. actually. I mean, it's, it's, it's an issue. Um, you know, JICA, Japan, Japan International Cooperation Agency, has been working very, very um, deeply in many countries on, especially on the science and technology sort of uh, capacities. Um, and then it's been a long process. You know, it's in many mm -hmm. countries, they've been working mm -hmm. more than 10 years, more than mm -hmm. decades, and still there's a lot of actual challenges to be met. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, it's important, of course, um, that uh, we actually have the skilled sort of coders, yes, developers. That's a, that's a very important part, but we really need to think in a bigger scale in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. creating the capacity of the people who actually have the logical sort of thinking, as well as like uh, science and technological you know, knowledge and so on, you know, mathematical skills. Without these foundational skills, we will not be able to create, uh, you know, the, the developers who are capable mm -hmm. of actually, you know, meeting the demand wow. globally. Wow. Um, another another part which is important too is also the language actually, you know, for example, countries like in Japan, uh, they won't actually have someone who can understand who speak their own language, so which is a bit unfortunate, but I think this is also very important part. Yes. I think. Um, you know, even though that they, are, they may actually have the coding skills uh, or the skills necessary to actually not only the coding skills, but different skills the language actually remains to be pretty important, even though we have, you know, the yes. translation tools and so on so forth. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's also something that we need to be mindful and how can we bridge yes. the gap. Um, I agree. For example, like uh, JICA has been working in Vietnam, for example, they actually created a Japanese language school with actually IT schools combined. Mm -hmm. So to actually cater to specific market. So that mm -hmm. is something that also, you know, like for example, government could really think about, you know, not only the technological skills, yeah. but also the linguistical and also the business skills as well. You know, that's actually yeah. need to be like, language, language is a governance issue or well, like two or maybe even language learning so okay so I, I see we, we have to postpone the pandemic uh, uh, Sorry. Uh, results. no no that's fine i think man and is on your on your trip right you want to maybe say more about education 
Yes, yes. I think okay. this is one of the most important things because we don't only need developers. I mean, this is one of the biggest needs we have that we also need this people between development and the business side who can translate the business requirements into a smart technology or technology features that are actually usable. Um, which is a big problem because developers are always looking straight ahead and, and they have some trouble figuring out how to implement things that are actually needed from the business perspective. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the aspect that the things you need offline might not be the same things you need online because the people tend to react differently when they're online. So how do you find the right solution to translate what, what you do offline into an online world and, and maybe even connect the two things? I think this is something which is really new and um, maybe you have to start um, educating yourself within the company. So because there might not be the right person who has the understanding of your specific industry and also of the right technology to use. So uh, the person in between might be from one of those areas and then you have to educate them in the second one yourself. I think okay. this might so, so this is kind of a, of a different level and speaking the same language. So it, yes. you, you may have the same mother tongue, but, but you don't speak the same language in terms of the product and the development and of maybe even of the goals you want to have. Yes, yes. And of course, a business person doesn't speak the language of a development person. This mm -hmm. is just impossible. You need a project manager in between to translate uh, your needs mm -hmm. into a, a doable a solution. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe one more thing about the language. Um, we recognize that we are currently developing in Armenia, which is a completely different country with completely different structures they actually have trouble understanding how Germany works, how German people think, how they use technology, how they move on a platform. So for us, it's also a big issue to translate the German way of thinking or the German way of doing business. So even though you can use or you can work with people from other countries, there's still some issues you need to find a way to work around. To, to so do our, our talk about earlier, we, we, we had the, the, the data the data flow which is a good thing and and kind of a framework for reliable data flow but then we have also got quite a different framework um, for understanding um, okay is any anybody wants to comment on this on this question of um, of this way of working together because of course this has other other um, implications too for cross-border work, but but I, I would like to, to put this later. Shivanta, please. Yeah, I, I think we we have walked the talk uh, with NASCOM. Uh, uh, we are the official partners to the government of India on upscaling. Uh, the Prime mm -hmm. Minister launched it, uh, what we call Future Skills and Future Skills Prime program. Uh, you know, we we have a platform provider. We haven't developed our own platform. So Edcast is our platform provider. And then the, we've sourced the best content in uh, eight or nine technology areas, including AI, robotics, machine learning, cybersecurity, 3D printing, IoT, blockchain, et cetera, et cetera. And then we've looked at uh, 70 odd job roles and developed uh, competency standards for those jobs. So, and because of the fact that, uh, you know, you have academia, you have industry, but it's led by business. So around the world, as digital transformation takes place, the biggest challenge is evolving at a, uh, for academia to evolve at a pace which the industry needs. And I think to some extent, we've been able to bridge that gap. We've uh, kind of had about a million people on this platform. Mm -hmm. and, and the Prime Minister has given us a mandate to upskill nearly 4.5 million people in the next five years, uh, which is what the industry numbers are in terms of employability. Uh, and, and I think, in, uh, trans, uh, you know, if you look at competency standards, uh, you know, how do we look at uh, building a global alignment on those competency standards and some of these job roles could be an interesting one for all of us to discuss because if there's anything which keeps uh, CEOs awake at night, it's the issue of talent. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you can you can talk all about the fancy digital transformation work which is happening, but from you know there can be a huge supply side bottleneck. 
uh, and and we are doing uh, a fair bit, uh, you know, hands on doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, again, I would like to try to to move on a little bit to the question: What did we learn in the pandemic? And Afterwards, we, we will conclude what, what you all contributed, and we will also talk about, again, about the, the comments that also were um, input in Slido, like market access and local platforms and scalability. We, we will maybe can actually uh, work a little bit from, from this when we talk about how the uh, platform economy helped or even promoted um, small and medium-sized enterprises. What are your experiences or your observations? Um, if I if I would edit this question, <laughs> yes, please speak up. Okay, okay, speak up. Okay, okay, yes. Um, <coughs> it is actually it's remarkable how actually uh, people have to have to adapt to this uh, you know lockdown, especially mm -hmm. during the COVID nineteen. Um, I was doing actually research in North Africa at that time, and I actually have to quickly come back to, uh, to home because everybody you know, they actually closed the borders. Uh, but after that, we've seen globally how they had to survive, especially SMEs, right? Uh, because the means of actually, you know, the livelihood was all of a sudden lost. So they actually jumped into different actually, you know, platforms and they sold, they started selling their products online. They were delivering these products online. Uh, they are actually getting the you know the products so that they could actually do the product. So all of a sudden, they actually had to realize that they, they had to use it, this platform uh, economy basically, uh, which is including actually the financial transactions as well. A lot of countries were hesitant, especially the people were hesitant to use uh, the digital transactions, right. you know, with uh, real money being around. But they couldn't do it because you couldn't go to shop. Right, or you actually had to say like, okay, we will not touch the money, right? Uh, or to, to see each other. So that's really actually forced people to use. And then that kind of cultural sort of transformation of the business process, I think it was really a wake up call. Uh, but also it's, I think it's gonna last uh, for, for many countries mm -hmm. because now they actually trust it as if, oh, you know, the platform actually works. You know, I actually survived during this uh, COVID-19 because thanks to the you know, platform and also all the services which actually were built onto this platform. And this was especially true, I think in, uh, you know, hardest hit places of the COVID-19, yes? Um, if I actually say, uh, one regret I have is, for example, Japan, um, we may not have been, uh, this is a little bit of controversial things to say, but I was expecting more transformation <laughs> if they actually were hit a little bit more harder than uh, it might actually have um, actually in other countries, um, because that's really forced a lot of countries and a lot of SMEs to say, okay, this is a new way of doing things. And, you know, once actually they learn the new, you know, way of new trick, they would stay, you know, they will stay and they will flourish with it. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a really a great opportunity here for the business transformations, especially with SMEs. Okay, thank you. Anna, please. Um, I'd like to add on that, and I and I think the experience in Brazil is a bit different, maybe because the, the gap of the digital transformation was a little bit broader. So I think we, we really felt more, um, really society transforming and SMEs um, uh, uh, appearing as a result of the pandemic. In a certain way, I do believe that the, uh, the upside uh, of such a tragedy has been to expedite, and folks talk about 10, 15 years in Brazil in terms of the digital inclusion uh, of society. And here talking about um, younger folks and older folks that uh, were really uh, against technology. They would prefer to go to the next door store to buy something and all of a sudden everything needs to happen online. So, so the, the, the relevance was tremendous. 
um, as well as um, really uh, people that lost jobs and that ha had to find ways uh, of uh, making a living that became entrepreneurs, so became really small business and actually have been a business now that are flourishing because of it. So I think it's um, the changes have been really structural uh, mm -hmm. in a certain way. Um, it I would be interested to see like in five years from now, whether that's a, a long-term trend or whether this uh, was a reaction, but it does seem to be uh, something that has been really ingrained in society uh, in terms of it's okay to go digital. Okay. This is very interesting because we were all talking about very strategic, like how to foster, how to promote, and all of this sudden this this awful pandemic happened, which has brought so much sorrow and pain over so many people around the world. But but then all of a sudden it works without strategy. <laughs> this is this is really a surprise. Um, uh, Alex, I would like to ask you whether you see have also uh, encountered in, in Rwanda that maybe SMEs can be promoters of of pandemic uh, relief in a way of overcoming the, the bad uh, results of yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, so what we saw, uh, especially uh, at the beginning of the first lockdowns, which were around March, um, we saw there was panic. Um, there was panic. Uh, at first, uh, people thought maybe it's going to be a short while after uh, two weeks, um, we may get back, uh, we may get back to the, uh, uh, we may get out and back. And, and then two weeks uh, turned into, uh, <laughs> Uh, a month and then uh, turn into three months. And, um, uh, but within that uh, one, we saw our members um, getting, um, getting on, working with SMEs, uh, seeking, coming up with new solutions on, uh, on, on facilitating, uh, whether it's uh, distant farmers, rural farmers, uh, or people uh, in marketplaces, because some essential workers were um, uh, were given movement permission, and um, and that uh, quickly moved from uh, a member base, uh, a core group of just uh, around eighteen um, eighteen platforms that we were working with, or that were member uh, company e-commerce um, member companies uh, within the essential services sector. Uh, up to rose uh, to uh, thirty and uh, to sixty, and and, and that uh, with it came increase uh, transaction volumes as well. So on, on, in terms of moving, uh, in terms of moving goods, um, some um, have uh, have not survived um, the, the, the period uh, to now the second wave, third wave, uh, so to speak. Uh, but some have stayed on on, on course. Um, some pivoted uh, from uh, focusing on certain sectors into focusing on uh, um, on the food and drug uh, space, mm -hmm. and that um, has uh, that enabled uh, SMEs to continue trading, to continue doing business. Um, and then uh, the other uh, the, the other trend we saw uh, was social commerce. Um, transacting and selling on, um, on social platforms, social network platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. Um, so besides uh, just having to go onto a marketplace, uh, people were setting up their own shops um, on, these, uh, on these platforms. And that has also uh, increased um, uh, tremendously. Actually, last week uh, during our local IGF, uh, we had one uh, youngster testifying how that has grown over uh, over the last uh, 18 months and uh, she sells on instagram as well as on uh, on facebook and whatsapp mm -hmm. and she uh, and uh, uh, uses another local uh, delivery uh, company uh, for deliveries so these um, are beginning to stick um, among smes and msmes uh, the other thing that we saw was the rise of merchant payments, digital payments. I know 
for most of mm-hmm. you, this is a common thing. Uh, you're used to buying online and paying with your credit card. Um, uh, with the prevalence of mobile, as I earlier said, uh, we saw those numbers uh, going up, actually. Um, merchant payments were up by 530%. Um, so, and that that is basically um, in terms of volumes, uh, but also in terms of transaction, n- numbers of transaction. Mm-hmm. So we believe that that's, uh, these uh, are sticking after, I think Atsushi uh, is the one who mentioned the element, the part that uh, governments removed or scrapped some uh, transaction charges, uh, even uh, operators and platforms um, they, uh, removed some uh, transaction fees uh, that uh, further um, increased that. But even when they were reintroduced, uh, the drop was um, was not significant. The drop in, in adoption or, or, or usage or volume um, was not significant uh, compared to the registered growth. So yeah, um, that's, it. that's what we're seeing uh, in Rwanda. Mm-hmm. And we're working also to, to see how we catalyze and, uh, and make sure that there's retention uh, mm-hmm. and minimize uh, those that go back to the old ways. Okay, so, so there were some very positive effects there too. And some uh, mobilization I might, might, might be the, the, the word that, that, that covers the different um, 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 the, the different trends you all um, told us about. I would like, because we are not really at the end, I'm glad, but a little bit moving to the end, I would like now to, to talk with you about what we've learned so far a little bit in terms of uh, uh, supportive regulatory and governance framework for SMEs in the, in the, in the platform economy. And um, before we uh, start our discussion, I would like to um, see again, please, Katarina, the, the answers to the, to the last question we had um, on our Slido poll. Yes. We have uh, two more questions to talk about. One also fitting your discussion is the question about the biggest regulatory obstacles for SMEs to participate in the platform business. And there's uh, some of the the things you already described, all of you. And for example, to comply with the same regulatory demands as big companies that do not consider the lower bureaucratic capacities, also various diverging domestic regulation um, and um, I, I, I think there's a wish for a clear global legal framework that would be appreciated. And another point fitting to this point, diverging national regulatory frameworks, which hinders uh, them to scale beyond one country. Mm-hmm. So the matter of regulation, um, uh, yeah, above countries um, is, is quite interesting. And then we have, um, one question, but that might be one a question for for the end of the discussion because um, the the audience had the option to post open questions here, and one person wanted to know how to, to p- participate in your initiative. So um, this might be something for the end. Okay. Thank you very much. But I think indeed that the, the, the answers or the input um, to the uh, regulatory obstacle question is really, really revealing. And we had already, as Katarina said, uh, some of the cross-border issues. But um, I would like to, to um, ask you what uh, to describe the clash between the local and national norms Um, with a global nature of trade, to to, to put this a little larger. We had the data issue that was very important, but I think this is um, other issues uh, come in there too. Like example, uh, the promise of the platforms is to to have market access, uh, as as it was mentioned in the the first Slido uh, answer too. So increase market access, access, reach customers you haven't reached before. And... um, so then all of a sudden you may be 
come to 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 an international platform or international sphere with 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 your product and service and you have countries from com customers from other places so what can help uh, a small sized business to make use of this promise in terms of market access what does the entrepreneur who wants to do this what does he or she need to be successful in that and this transfer from the local uh, sea to the international market. What would they need first? What do you think? Shivanda, please. Well, you know, I think a couple of things, uh, you know, while the focus is on platform economies for SMEs, uh, for market access specifically, you know, I just came back last week from Canada with 45 SMEs, uh, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of deals which were in the pipeline got closed when in-person face-to-face meetings happened mm -hmm. for SMEs. Uh, you know, unlike large organizations who have teams in different parts of the world who can close deals, uh, you know, for SMEs, I think, you know, that in-person uh, connect is, is absolutely critical, uh, you know, so that's one. The second is obviously credibility. How do they, you know, how do you build credibility for SME? Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, you know, unlike a large company which has, uh, you know, uh, golden, uh, you know, clients as, uh, you know, as testimonials for SMEs, it's not the same. And even if they have testimonials, a lot of their international clients find it difficult to know that. So, you know, so a lot of that, I think is important but from a platform perspective i think the biggest problem for smes uh, you know especially is with the legacy way of doing things so i think generating mm -hmm. an understanding and awareness of what a benefit of getting onto a platform is and that too is different from a product company vis-a-vis -a, -vis a services company i think it's slightly more easier from a product company perspective uh, so that mm -hmm. is important getting out of the manual system thinking and saying, you know, this is beneficial because your ROI is going to grow from, from you know, 30 to 40%. You are able to scale up in a very quick manner. The barriers to entry are less. I think that is something, um, you know, as in a structured way, uh, you know, programs when, which are designed for SMEs, uh, you know, how do you access cultural issues? You know, because they're obviously not, you know, aware of some of that. So these are a few things, uh, you know, which I think uh, mm -hmm. are critical, uh, you know, from an SME perspective. Yeah, yeah. This, uh, that's interesting what you say between this uh, legacy versus um, discovering the new opportunities, and and a project uh, we have done, um, which was about um, increasing participation of of uh, SMEs in the internet governance. And our project was funded by the German Federal Ministry uh, for Economy. And in this project, we had we talked with many entrepreneurs and they they said that when, one of them said it's an old traditional family owned uh, business. And they are so used to have this one on one contact with their customers. They are producing things and with their, with their customers that they um, acknowledge the need to, to keep in the market, to stay in the market, and that platforms will be the only way, even for producers, even for specialized tools, devices, whatever, components, even they need the platform to reach the customers, to reach new customers, but then the way of doing it was so different from before. And, and um, I think this is a real issue here, and um, I'm wondering if uh, one of you has um, uh, ideas about how to handle this or maybe even programs. Anna, maybe? I see you nodding. Thank you. Um, I think it, it, it's, um, it, it's an interesting perspective. Uh, and Sh Shivendra mentioned that the uh, maybe for uh, the product company might be even easier uh, from uh, the uh, services company. 
and I'm thinking here about import procedures. Brazil, for instance, is known for the complexity uh, of import mm -hmm. proceedings and not being able to actually get things um, in the country. And in that sense, maybe for this topic, we actually have um, uh, places where this conversation can happen, which is which is way to actually facilitate uh, the flow uh, of physical products um, um, in different jurisdictions uh, and maybe with ways to simplify that uh, for, for SMEs. Um, and uh, I do agree uh, here uh, that uh, the legacy uh, way of doing things is, is really a problem. And it's a problem for this whole discussion. We are used to look at the legacy and trying to replicate that mm -hmm. for, for, the, for the digital economy. And that just doesn't, uh, doesn't work. But it seems to me that from a, where the digital connects with the physical or the delivery of physical goods, it might be easier um, to address some of the questions than uh, we are only talking about flow of data uh, or rendering of mm -hmm. uh, services per se. Um, it's, um, it's more difficult to actually uh, get the regulation or all the oversight in the, um, in the services arena. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Um, Atsushi, please. Actually, that's, that's very interesting. But, you know, uh, uh, Frederica, I think you mentioned about the cases of like uh, the German companies, SMEs, actually having a difficult time adjusting it. Um, I was thinking maybe how, actually, that might be a challenge, uh, actually, uh, advantage or opportunities for, like, especially the new sort of SMEs, I think. How can you actually retain this sort of individual touch? within the digital platform area right. or digital transactions. I think that might be a real opportunities here. You know, we talk about, of course, business process re-engineering, you know, changing everything. Of course, that's, of course, in the process wise, it's important, but at the same time, can we actually incorporate this contextualization or individual sort of connections in the new digital transaction arena? Because that actually might be a key for not only the traditional SMEs to actually come on board, but at the same time, actually having sort of whole new sort of set of, you know, the, the customers. And then, and then I think, uh, I think it, uh, it was mentioned by actually Manan about the needs for translator, right? From the technology side to the, um, to the customers, but also from the customers to the, the producers or the service providers. If you're talking about the global sort of marketplace where they have so many different contexts, you know, uh, Maran was talking about this, uh, you know, Armenian people do not understand how the journal works. But can we incorporate perhaps that kind of translation facilities or like uh, connecting facilities within the new digital platform? I think that might actually give us a whole new set of uh, market access. What do you think? Uh, I think that's very interesting. And I, I pass on this question, of course, to Manan. But I would like to add um, another, uh, an extension of the question, which is, I would like to hear an answer that is not, I will just try harder to do this, but an answer that is about how can we jointly manage this? This is then about governance, Do you know? Manan, please. Yes, I'm not sure if I can your I can answer your extension. Um, no, no, stop with <laughs> your answer anyway. I, I do agree with Atsushi. I, I don't think it's wrong to translate the, the non non-digital world into the digital world because mostly it's not so different. And I think this is something you have to tell the SMEs. It's not like you're doing something completely new. You are transforming all your business and you have to rethink all the processes you're doing. I think this is the biggest mistake you can make because these SMEs have problems enough. They don't need to wonder about, oh my God, I've been doing everything wrong the whole time and now I have to redo it to, to fit into the new world. I don't think this is right. I think what we are doing with platforms is creating new services, new digital technologies or tools that actually help doing them what they have been doing all the time, maybe a bit better and, and not completely different. And since we started talking differently to our customers, which are manufacturers and vendors, of course, so all of the SMEs, and we have talked to over 200 so far, 
um, we have recognized that it actually helps to tell them this is just a tool. You decide how you use it and you can use as much of it as you want. It can help to improve your processes, but it's not going to override everything you have done so far. It's just going to help you. And I think this is very important that we are not rethinking the world completely at once because I don't think SMEs are ready for that. We have to help them to do small steps and learn step by step what to do next and, and how to achieve things. You have had help in planning your platform. And maybe you can tell us a little bit how this worked, not, not maybe in detail, but, but you didn't invent everything from scratch, did you? No, we did not. Actually, our platform is uh, founded on everything we did in the shop. We already mm -hmm. had inspiration to buy and we already had sample boxes. And what helped us was that someone from outside looked at our business model and said, okay, these are great features, but at the mm -hmm. moment you are doing it yourself. If you just outsource this to the crowd, if you let the community do the work for you, so invert your business, you might be doing the same thing, but much much more efficiently. And you, you can reach more people and you can scale the, 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 the products and services you are offering. So that's what he actually did. And mm -hmm. he told us a lot about... Um, the economy you have to build around your business model and the networks you have to work, the, the community you have to build to be able to work with it. So I think um, what's very difficult for SMEs is to understand that um, platforms are much more transparent and they, they build on networks and working together and, and being open for cooperation instead of being closed up and saying, I, I don't want any competitor to know anything about me and I am going to be the only one. I think mm -hmm. joining and doing this together, even with your competitors, it can be very powerful. Okay, that's that's a very important <laughs> uh, uh, link there too, to how to cooperate. Um, but yes, I, I know that all of you are experienced in... Um, creating, developing, and running really support networks. And, and we have had a public uh, support as Shivendra uh, told in, in various ways, but we also have the support of associations and industry associations and Nanan had uh, the support. She, she went to a, to a um, digital, let me call it development agency, something like a competence center. Uh, uh, fostered by, by, by the government. And um, so this is a network. What kind of elements do we need in this support network? This is a regulatory framework starting of course with laws and maybe international um, 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 laws too or international um, uh, treaties uh, too. But then we have the law, but then we have the private public sector what what are your experiences with that what what are, what have what has been helpful in creating a governance framework in this cascade um, that worked well if i may uh, i think uh, there are there are ways that you can have a mechanism for um, specific line of, lines of financing, for instance, that would uh, benefit um, the these companies coming into the market. Um, structures whereby you can foster NGO investors in, and here I talk about structures in terms of protecting of liability, where you can actually benefit uh, from um, investors that were successful in terms of channeling, uh, and not only uh, financial resources, but the expertise uh, of how they managed to um, actually um, have their own unicorns um, into that. And, and obviously, I'd say trade associations or forums like the, the IGF in terms of capacitation. Um, I, I, do, I do have a sense that um, often um, there is a complexity uh, that drives 
um, um, entrepreneurs to think it's just too difficult or too distant. Um, mm -hmm. And initiatives, uh, multi-stakeholders initiatives where you can have the conversation um, are absolutely um, essential for that as well. I think mm -hmm. it's way beyond the, the financial resources. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when we had the, the discussion, um, uh, in Brazil, another issue that was raised and, I, and that I think it's also an interesting approach um, is uh, structuring of tax breaks that can be offered for um, uh, small uh, companies and entrepreneurs uh, for to allow them to mm -hmm. use those resources for capacity building mm -hmm. uh, or actually for, uh, for that jump start. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think this happened in Rwanda too, right? to create the ICT uh, ecosystem. Yes, um, you have been working with, uh, actually the, the, the earlier examples mentioning uh, that uh, shared with us uh, uh, the list of youngsters that uh, recent graduates that are looking for uh, mm -hmm. opportunities. Uh, it's because of these frameworks that we have uh, with government and um, working with them uh, right now uh, what's we, actually last year? Yeah, um, early this year we started working on the um, technology uh, policy um, for uh, for startups, uh, or rather uh, the Startup Act, uh, which aims to really create frameworks um, and incentive structures uh, that help um, those that want to uh, start new businesses, mm -hmm. but also. Uh, those that uh, the, 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 the different stakeholders, uh, entrepreneurs, support organizations, uh, um, uh, and all the people in the in that value chain uh, to be able to um, to work together, but also to uh, take advantage of uh, certain regulatory uh, frameworks and instruments. So um, they, they, for us, I would say we've been lucky uh, to uh, uh, one is a small country. Uh, but two, we, we have a, a kind of a young leadership uh, group that um, understands and we work very uh, closely together to make sure that actually the business environment um, okay. is conducive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, um, our time is over. I'm, I'm sad about it because there were so many issues that, that were brought up and I would have liked to, to discuss in more depth. My final question to one of you, and of course, please be brief. Um, we've heard very interesting approaches and best practices for how to promote SMEs participation in the platform business and uh, foster this by regulation, good regulation. Which one was your most impressive example? Um, what would you like to take home with you what you hadn't heard before or would like to um, increase at home. Who's the brave one to, to start? Okay, what about you, Shivenda? Well, was... You know, I think uh, I quite liked uh, Manan's argument that, and, and I did mention it uh, initially as well, that, you know, uh, they need flexibility. You know, you you, you cannot have, uh, you know, fixed rules because digital economy is something which is evolving. You talked about, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic and how that's impacted. You know, 95% mm -hmm. uh, uh, of companies went into work from home mode and still uh, most of them are doing that and are doing that very successfully. Now, uh, whether this is going to be the uh, model or whether it's the hybrid is going to be the model the way technology is evolving, you know, every every day is going to be a new day. So similarly, uh, you know, <laughs> the flexibility, I think, uh, you know, which, which Manan mentioned in terms of having, uh, uh, you know, the best of the platform business, as well as, um, as Atsushi also mentioned, uh, you know, being able to have that, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one connect with, uh, you know, customers is one big thing which, which I'm going to take away for is. Thank you. Um, Anna, your takeaway. Um, uh, I, do, um, I do have to say that, first of all, thank you for, for the discussion. It's been incredible and did uh, stand out uh, 
So she's uh, comment on the the, the in person uh, interaction and uh, the very uh, custom uh, relationship. I think we tend to have the discussion in terms of the the the, the digital and everything online. Uh, but for SMEs, uh, the the distance um, from the the physical environment, I think it's uh, a little a little shorter. Uh, and and the challenge here is to be able to keep the connection locally, but to be able to actually have the 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 global the global access. Um, and so, uh, how how do you intertwine these two realities, which uh, in a way I guess is one mm -hmm. of the, the additional challenges which we cannot <laughs> we we cannot address with uh, policies or regulation. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. At sushi. Your takeaway. Uh, thank you so much. Actually, I, I tend to speak too much, but uh, I learned so much from like uh, all the participants. I mean, the panelists. Uh, I, this was very, very enriching discussions, and then I could go forever uh, on this kind of topic. <laughs> one takeaway uh, but, is enough. I know one takeaway. Okay, yes, so one takeaway. Yes. So I, I particularly like Anna's actually comment, and like we should not lower the threshold for the SMEs, and I think that was very, very important. I think rather, I think we should facilitate. And you know, creating a mechanism so that the SME could actually adapt to this higher threshold. I think that is very important because we're not actually, you know, making SMEs less competitive, right? So in order for them to be more competitive, of course, they have to, you know, go to the higher level. Uh, but it's really important that we provide the facilities, we provide the education, like digital you know, literacies and all these things, so that we could make sure that they would adapt. And also, you know, individualize their services in the digital arena. Thank you, uh, Manan. Your takeaway. Sorry, I forgot. I was on mute. Um, yes, I actually agree with Atsushi. I think we we have to help the SMEs to to be able to achieve the higher threshold. But still, I think. They need some kind of entry level. I think they need some trials or some some very clear guidelines on how they can actually profit from from doing okay. more work and then doing that. And then I think they are actually uh, able to manage it. Okay, Alex, the final words. Uh, uh, thank thank you. So. Uh, my takeaways are on um, so, some uh, pieces that uh, Shivendra mentioned on uh, occupational standards uh, competencies and what they've been able to uh, build um, with, in NASCOM and, and translation. I think uh, from Atsushi and uh, Manen uh, uh, speaking of the languages and this globalization brings about uh, whether translation, translating uh, specs uh, or translating uh, in terms of uh, the different cultures and languages uh, that we're coming from. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad that this session uh, was also streamed, as you know, on YouTube, and we can look at, watch it there again, and we can go back there and, and take all this wonderful, the, the, this rich input, can, can visit it again, watch it again and, and think about it more, which we will certainly do. And please get back to us um, if you want any, if you need any, if you want to connect, for example, we will be happy to do this. And I also invite the audience, please uh, get back to us and uh, ask us and uh, we'll happily provide additional information, additional, additional resources as good as we can, and, and we'll be there to uh, connect you all. I thank you very, very much for being here. I thank everybody in, in the audience online and out there, and I thank the team in Katowice for the support, for the technical support, for the help, for the very, very wonderful IGF, for the whole IGF. This is really a great opportunity. As we found out today, we need places to, to, um, uh, to, to exchange. And um, so thanks to you uh, and the Technic team, it really managed, it really worked out that we have a internet uh, united, the motto of uh, this year's IGF 2021. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you all again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.